what is essential about you, what do you really think. So it's like a self-diagnostic, uh, is that fair? Self-diagnostic? Well, it's self-analysis, but on a very fundamental level. It's like how to live according to Socrates' principle of know thyself. Uh, one way would be to find out what you like in art. Oh, it's an excellent way to find out yeah. about yourself. Now, what does philosophy have to do with it? Does it have anything to do with philosophy? Well, yes, when we talk about basic values, we're talking about man's view of himself, his view of life, his view of the world. We are talking about philosophical ideas. So it's another way of saying, another way of saying the definition might be it's a selective recreation of reality according to the artist's basic philosophy. Yes, but the reason that she talked about basic values because art involves value judgments. Right. It's not an issue of technical philosophy. I see. You see? Yes. It's not an issue of the law of identity or uh, theories of epistemology. It's an issue of values. All right. Now, I think that uh, you've given us a good uh, preliminary. We have a number of callers. Can we have on line 12, Robert? Are you there? Welcome to the Leonard Peacock Show. Yes. Hi, Dr. King. Hi, Robert. Uh, listen, I wanted to start out by saying this, uh, that uh, I'm... Uh, a student of uh, objectivism, and I embrace it as far as I've studied it. So I want you to know I'm a, I'm a basically a friendly voice here. Okay, but, so let's hear the antagonistic question. Yeah, uh, well, I also am an artist, and I'm going to take exception with some of the premises that uh, used in the definition, and I'll tell you the exceptions that I will take. Okay. First of all, none of the, uh, first of all, the description of art having to do with a reflect being a reflection of reality. Recreation. Recreation of reality completely yeah. excludes uh, elements of imagination and fantasy. In other words, a fantasy okay, that's art. clear. That's uh, clear. Okay. Next. Uh, also, that I would say that an artist, much as an actor, is uh, able to portray, say, a different emotion. An artist may per per paint a different painting with a different intent and ju and just because it's one artist doesn't mean he can't say several different things okay as an example yeah uh, i got you okay you know i mean uh, as an artist myself i was hired to paint a a uh, painting of a album cover which was supposed to be a, a vampire it was a very dark thing on the other hand i painted paintings that were very fantasy and unicorn uh, a completely different style a completely different mood okay robert you got two exceptions and that's all you get because we got other colors okay uh, but i'd like to hear a response to that yeah we're going to do it right now uh marianne number one by you saying it's a recreation of reality are you excluding the use of imagination and fantasy absolutely not i mean Imagination is a prerequisite in, in this regard. He must use his imagination. That's in the word selective, right? Exactly. What about and fantasy, something that doesn't purport to be reality, like the Twilight Zone? But, you see, in projecting any fantasy, you have to select some things which do exist in order to recreate the idea of that fantasy, as the Twilight Zone does. I or, see. Yeah. Or take, in sculpture, we talk about gargoyles monsters, that sort of thing in art. These things don't exist in reality, but parts of them do, and the yeah. idea of combining them exists. So art does not exclude fantasy. So as long as it's some kind of recognizable entity, it can be fantasy, but you draw the line, presumably, when it becomes smears or just a pile of rubble that stands for nothing. Oh, absolutely, because when you talk about rubble and smears, you're talking about what might have been sculpture and painting. Painting, if I can uh, cover this issue quickly, a painter recreates reality by means of color on a two-dimensional surface, and a sculpture shapes a solid material into the form of something, usually the human figure, although not always. Now, in order to convey values, you must create a context in which the values can be expressed. Color alone, shape alone, does not fill the bill. Colors and shapes don't exist apart from things that possess them. You don't have floating greenness and floating roundness. Only green things and round things. So even if it's a fantasy version of reality it still has to be a version of a world that we can recognize objects in exactly all right now let me ask you robert's second question he basically is saying uh, uh 
can't the same artist with the same basic value judgments portray radically different views of reality in different works, and therefore you, you can't say it's only his basic value judgments that are always at work? Well, then we're talking about someone who has two uh, sets of basic values. Conflicting, you mean? Conflicting ones, contradictory ones. And he can then stress one or the other. Yes, people, there is the phenomenon, I, I understand, regarding people, the way people hold ideas and values. Consistency is not guaranteed to man in his ideas. He may hold clashing values. At sometimes a certain set prevails in his life. At other times, another set prevails in his life. Well, and what about if an artist has a tremendous skill, he has a completely consistent let's say, malevolent view, mm -hmm. but he's incredibly skillful. Would he be able, if he wanted to, as an exercise to create a convincing painting re di uh, uh, representing the exact opposite of his view, just out of skill alone? No, he I wouldn't. don't think that would be psychologically possible to him. You see, what is he going to summon forth? What is he going to rely on? I guess he'd have to copy somebody else. Possibly. Okay, thank you. you. See, I don't think that that artist would be driven to paint or yes. to sculpt something that contradicts his basic values. Very clear. On line 11, John, are you still there? John? Hello? On line 11, John? Are you there? I don't hear you, John. Hello? John? I think there's Ed this time. Oh, this is Ed, then. Ed, uh, what? Uh, okay, I didn't know anything about you, Ed. Welcome to the Leonard Pigov Show. Why, right, thank you. Yes, I have a couple of questions. The first one is, you were talking about a picture being worth a thousand words. Yeah. And I was wondering if the reverse is true, if one word is worth a thousand pictures. Well, that's, you're taking that from my book, I assume, right? No, I was just thinking about that. As I you... wrote that. Oh, you did? Yes. So, uh, the, but that's in a completely different sense. That's the importance of language. But that doesn't contradict what Mrs. Surrey said. So, uh, it's two different contexts. But right now, let's stick to art. What's your other question? Well, I was wondering if modern art is really art then, because all it has is a bunch of blurbs and, and uh, you know, uh, colors thrown up there, and it's unintelligible, and it's unclear, and that type of thing. So with that kind of modern Mary Ann, would you say modern art is bad art or non-art? Uh, if you talk about modern art as non-objective, yes. yesterday the issue came up what's modern and what's contemporary. If you mean by modern art, non-objective, things without subjects, unintelligible, no, it's not art. It's not just bad art, it's not it's art. It's not art. Yeah, I, I look art at... Art recreates reality. Yeah. And if there's no reality, that's the end. In right. fact, I've heard modern art called anti-art because instead of giving us a vision of reality, whether true or false, it completely disintegrates reality. Exactly. So it does the very opposite of what, re what art is supposed to do. Since all of man's values pertain to reality, not to some other dimension, if he wants to express them, he must select things from reality in order to express them. Okay, we're going to take... things, not colors and shapes alone don't exist, nor can they convey anything. This is the last segment of our discussion with Mary Ann Suries, uh, a art historian whom I happen to have known for over 40 years, since 1953. Isn't that right, Mary Ann? 54. 54, so that's 40... 42 years. Right, you were my first philosophy teacher. Well, you were my first art teacher, so we've both come a long way. I've got a couple of callers and a hundred questions I want to ask. So let's take on line seven, Ross. You've been waiting a while. Are you there, Ross? Yes, good afternoon, Doctor, and good Hi. afternoon to your guest. I've been listening with, with uh, rapt interest at the, at the definitions that uh, Marianne has provided, and I think in terms of uh, communication value, while any visual art, painting, sculpture, etc., it seems that uh, that the definitions that have been presented would hold quite nicely. But I wonder about something something that I would call more subjective and how you would relate this to to the artist interpretation and in, in communication as far as something like music. Well, Marianne, do you want to take a crack or do you want to leave it to me to give him a no, reference? No, I'm really not qualified to discuss music. M music, uh, Ross, is without doubt the single hardest art to uh, talk about. 
Ayn Rand actually did a whole essay, or a whole large part of an essay, on how her theory of art applies to music. And it had to do with the way the sounds were put together in relation to the auditory capacities of the human mind, so that music is actually able to give you a view of reality, but it doesn't do so in do you think the... Ann, excuse me, do you think Marianne would agree with that assessment? Marianne? Yes, I would. Yeah, no, she, uh, this is a very, very interesting article, but, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good at uh, summarizing complex theories. That is so complicated because it involves physiology of hearing and neurology in order to explain the kind of intervals that the human brain interprets in different ways. And uh, I wouldn't even dream of how to do that, but I'll give you the reference. It's in yeah. an article called Art and Cognition. And Marianne, do you remember what book it's in? The Romantic Manifesto. Oh, yes, the Romantic Manifesto. The Romantic Manifesto. Okay. Uh, so I would refer you to that, Ross. Thanks for your All call. All right, thank you. Marianne, in a word, since we brought up the name the Romantic Manifesto, and Romantic is Ayn Rand's school of art, the school that she belongs to, do you want to say anything off the cuff about what is romantic art as against other kinds of art? Well, as she defined romanticism, and as the um, term is, is applied, it pertains to a movement in literature. Now, in a vague sense, the term was applied to paintings and sculpture from the late 19th century or mid-19th century, but it has nothing in common with her definition of romanticism as it applies to literature. So you'd rather bypass that as far no, as... No, I think so. I think it complicates the issue. If, if okay. people read the Romantic Manifesto, they will grasp very well what she means by romanticism in literature. Yeah, in, in, in essence, I can just throw in a sentence or two. A romantic novel is one that has larger-than-life characters, heroes and villains, in which the characters act purposefully, uh, and there's a plot, a logical series of events leading to a climax. So it's a well-structured novel, logic in the events, larger-than-life characters. I, the opposite is called a naturalistic novel, and they, naturalists, denounce romantic literature, and they say, oh, that's not true. People are not heroes and villains like that. We're all pretty much gray, interchangeable, and the purpose of literature is just to show us men as they are, Without, there's no logic in our lives, there's no plot, so you get these rambling depictions of the folks next door. That's basically, in a nutshell, the difference. And, of course, Ayn Rand, philosophically, was all in favor of naturalism. Excuse me. Excuse you. Of romanticism. <laughs> On line nine, Marina, welcome to the Leonard Peikoff Show. Thank you. Um, first of all, can you spell Mrs. Sir's name? We didn't oh, hear that, and I I'm... S U R E S, Mary Ann Suries. S U R E S. Thank you. And then, can you relate the definition that's on the table here? This kind of goes back to a couple of questions ago, but maybe it's a little different spin on the the issue of whether somebody who does art or who claims that what he does is art is an artist. That. Um, if somebody claims to be an artist, is what he produces art? Where does that, where does the definition fit into what somebody objectively produces? In other words, uh, Marianne, is anybody an artist who calls himself one? No, no. As a matter of fact, we have a number of examples today and have had for the last 50 years of people who claim to be artists and are in fact not. These are the people who go around collecting junk and call them found objects. They collect driftwood. These are people who paint uh, without subject, just what's called smears or lines. They and, don't And why, artwork. by the definition, not? I beg your pardon? And why, by the definition that we're using, are they not artists? Is what they're doing not art? Because what they're creating is not art, is not intelligible. And not art, a reality. There are certain requirements for every artwork in order to qualify as an artwork. It must be intelligible. That means, it doesn't mean that you will be able to understand 
everything about the artwork when you perceive it. But that it is understandable, it rep 